Servus aus Berlin. Hi, my name is Matthias Rillich and today I'd like to talk to you about 10 simple rules for increased lab resilience. Now in the everyday operations of a lab, we don't think about calamities and catastrophes that may befall us because we are busy with the everyday operations of the lab. But there are some things that you can do um, in the normal operations of the lab that also make you more resilient when faced with one of those catastrophic events like the current pandemic. So um, when our lab was closed down, we started meeting online basically right away. Also to help ourselves and to have an outlet in this stressful situation. And um, it was during these very first weeks of this uh, first shutdown in uh, March 2020 that we wrote this paper. Uh, that's now published in PLOS Computational Biology and you can find the link to this paper in the description down below. So as I said, this paper is based on our own experience with our own lab and basically yeah, the pieces of advice that we try to assemble were um, informed by that experience and what we thought one, what one could also do better. So here are the 10 rules. The first rule is foster a positive lab environment and build community. Now this is probably the most important of those 10 points because if your lab is a healthy place where people value each other and look out for each other, that property becomes even more important under situations like a pandemic or some other very stressful exterior influence. So a good team spirit can uh, help you overcome some of these stress, stressful situations. Uh, what we did, uh, we started um, a channel in our lab communication tool where people could share their thoughts, um, also share information that were in English because some of the information were also available predominantly in, in German at the time. And so basically build um, also an, an online support network for each other and also to check on each other. So when we hadn't heard of some people in some days, we would check on them. And subsequently what we've done is we, um, I ask people for weekly reports, even if there's not much to report, it's just a, a weekly check-in. And we started it during this time when you don't bump into each other anymore. Rule two is have well-established online communication tools. So we were really lucky that we started um, one of those uh, messaging tools. We use Slack, but you can use any other such tool as well. Uh, we had used this and made it a routine and made it a requirement for everybody that is in the lab to sign up for this uh, well ahead of when this um, all happened. And that proved to be just incredibly valuable because we uh, could basically continue to communicate without a break. And that was really important to get information out and, and still is very important to get information out. We had also started to uh, put some key pieces of information online that were usually verbally communicated things about how we organize our lab meetings or what the expectations are in terms of communicating with me and all these things that make make up basically um, um, lab culture. We had started writing these down and um, making them available online and that was also very important. Basically the, the recommendation is move key elements of your information flow online so you, it can continue when you can't come to the lab anymore. Rule number three is develop expertise in um, video communication tools. This we did not have. And um, that was, of course, um, a major obstacle to overcome. I think now the situation is different, but basically everybody is familiar with one or more of the uh, video communication apps. And uh, hopefully this will also continue when this pandemic is finally over and uh, we can still have um, guests online and we can still include people that are currently not in Berlin, maybe also in our future lab meetings. But I think this is a, a very important investment uh, in these um, online video communication tools. Now, rule number four is slightly less obvious, and this is diversify research approaches. 
And this is something that we had done, incidentally, uh, before this all hit. And I think it was very important in mediating some of the resilience that the, the lab in the end showed. And that was, you know, we are mostly an empirically based lab. We do lab experiments, greenhouse experiments, field observational studies. So yeah, we are a lab based group, but uh, very early on, there was also a culture established that research synthesis is valued, concept development is valued, research weaving, meta-analyses, those were all highly valued. And of course, these are the things that you can continue doing when the labs are unavailable. That was actually very good. It is good anyway, because it can increase your productivity under normal times. But under the difficult times of when the, uh, the lab was completely closed down, and now that it's uh, functioning basically on a, on a reduced basis, the diversity of approaches proved extremely important because a bachelor thesis could continue. Some bachelor, quite a few bachelor theses were, were basically changed to uh, more, having more literature synthesis, um, research weaving, bibliometry, meta-analytical approach, or a more conceptual approach, because that kind of work could still be done. And that was the same also for PhD students and for postdocs. So it is a good idea to do that anyway, uh, because it increases the likelihood that some of these approaches are still possible under um, catastrophic events and influences. Rule number five is establish engaging lab routines. And what we've done is we meet every Monday the entire year to discuss a paper and every Thursday um, to have some exchange amongst ourselves among, in terms of results or introducing new research ideas. And uh, to the extent that these things can and did continue, they provided a sense of continuity and also normalcy during more stressful times. And we also had things like pub nights every Thursday, and for many months, those continued also online with everybody sitting in front of their webcam at home. And that also um, provided a sense of continuity and, and comfort, really. And uh, very quickly, what I also started uh, was coffee breaks, online coffee breaks, video coffee breaks every uh, morning at nine. And so basically I've done them since March. Um, as I record this, it's November 2020. And that has also proven to be a very good means of communicating where people don't have to sign up for appointments. They just drop in, they're then held in the lobby of your uh, video communication app and you can let them in one by one. And we've since um, this paper's written also been experimenting, uh, experimenting also with um, some other apps that emulated experience of bumping into each other over a coffee. So that was definitely uh, very good to have established these routines of hanging out with each other and having regular appointments. Rule number six is to encourage collaboration. Um, in general, but also within the lab in particular. Uh, that's always been important to me and is something that is we were trying to foster as much as possible that um, people work together in, in groups. And when you have these little sub teams in, in a lab, we're a fairly big lab of um, over 50 people, but when you have smaller teams that work more closely together, it is much easier for them to help each other. And also, this, this uh, culture of um, contributing to other work, other people's work, and you could do, contributing your expertise to somebody else's, it is more productive anyway in, in, in good days, so to speak. But it was also particularly important during uh, times of crisis. And for example, how we wrote this paper. So basically, we um, all sat down online together, worked on some Google Doc and had some uh, video meetings about it and basically produced in a collaborative way this output of the 10 rules. Rule number seven is provide intellectual freedom. Sounds obvious, of course, you want to provide intellectual freedom. You got to remember most people in the lab are third party funded by grants from various agencies. So they have milestones to meet and um, expectations to fulfill in terms of uh, grants. But everybody is also afforded the freedom to pursue side projects, collaborations with other people, or also uh, just small projects that they pursue on their own. 
And that is also important because um, it increases the probability that some of these things are um, at a stage where they can be written up, where the analysis can be done, where you don't rely on lab so much maybe at that particular point in time. And it just increases the diversity of things that go on in the lab again. So um, giving people the freedom to pursue other projects, often in collaboration, but not always, also increases the probability that some of those will be in a, in a situation where they can be written up or worked on outside of the lab. Rule number eight is encourage flexible working times and arrangements. And um, so this we had already done. Basically, we have expectations for uh, joining in lab meetings on Mondays and Thursdays. Now, of course, since March, now is November 2020, online only. So people are expected to be there. But beyond that, people are totally free, basically, to um, budget their time. And uh, this has already led to some people having established home office arrangements. And so they were relatively less affected by the um, changes of having completely closed down the lab or not being able to come to offices as, as much um, as we have right now. And these people that had already basically been part of this diversity of uh, working arrangements, they, they were of course better able to deal with the new situation. And therefore, they overall contributed to the resilience of the lab as a whole. Rule number nine is embrace uncertainty and plan ahead. Now, this is what we try to do every, every day anyway. So a lot of what we do is uh, risk mitigation and risk management. We set up new experiments that are logistical challenges or just uh, expensive or a lot of work to do. We uh, pay attention to points such as well, can we pair this high risk project with some lower risk endeavors so that in the end you will have something and you don't have all your eggs in one basket. That is just good practice anyway. Other things you can do is, well, my experiment is running, it's running for a long time. I don't know what's gonna happen during the course of the experiment. Maybe there's equipment failure. Maybe I cannot come to the lab anymore. So then it is a real advantage if you can do some measurements also early on that are informative and sometimes you can plan that sometimes of course it's not possible from the question um, per se but sometimes you can plan ahead and say like okay i can already get some useful data at a very early stage and if i don't get the very last time points it's not catastrophic for uh, generating output from this particular study also what's good is if it, an experiment has multiple useful answers because it just uh, increases the parameter space under which you can um, use the data basically for something uh, that brings science forward. So is there only one result that um, one way of constellation of output that uh, really brings you forward or asking, are you asking more um, a more open question where no matter what the result is, it can be useful to you. I much prefer these experiments that give you multiple possible avenues for learning something rather than just, oh, if it's not this result, then we don't learn anything. And of course, those experiments that have a higher failure rate when you have only one potential useful answer and um, they don't contribute to success as much as the others under conditions of stress. And finally, 10, harness the power of social media. So by being on Twitter, for example, we um, collectively as a group got a, a lot of useful input we, uh, in terms of programs to use, uh, how to deal with certain situations, also to derive comfort from the fact that other people were having similar issues as you have. And that was um, very highly recommended. And so I also recommend everybody in the lab uh, to join Twitter or some, um, some other social media outlet because it can really serve that function. I found that very, very helpful and useful. Of course, you need to be careful that you don't get overwhelmed <laughs> with information bombarding your brain all the time. So it may also be important to do the opposite and sort of limit, of course, the time you spend on social media. Uh, but overall, I would say bottom line, that was a positive um, contribution to dealing with this crisis. So I think those are a set uh, from, of course, our own experience. Your experience, experience may be different. 
I think this is a useful set of, of 10 recommendations that if you follow them, I think you make your lab more resilient in the face of external um, calamities and catastrophes. And none of those is important to stress. None of those are in conflict with having a healthy lab environment and a productive lab environment. I think we have done now looking back on this year 2020, we have done very well in terms of output overall, in terms of getting people graduated and, and moving on in their careers. Of course, not everything could be expected to work as under normal conditions, it's obvious. But I think overall, I think having followed this approach has now contributed to resilience, which we can say now, as opposed to when we wrote this paper um, in March 2020. And, you know, during the lifetime of a lab, which is maybe 20, 30 years, you can expect some stressful external events. And so I think it's, it is important to think about these points and to establish them as possible. And many people already have uh, in the last months anyway. And finally, uh, remember that keeping a lab functioning as much as possible under very difficult extraneous influences is also beneficial for the people in the lab, of course, because uh, it provides a sense of continuity and normalcy during very stressful times and that you can rely on, on some things um, continuing to happen even during a um, crisis. So I hope you um, enjoyed hearing about these rules and um, you're welcome to look at the paper, it's open access, and if you have any questions and comments, please feel free to make them below the video. Hi there! If you like this video, don't forget to click like down there, and also remember to subscribe to the channel, and feel free to leave comments. See ya!